Martha just informed me that uh, one of our uh, Bible study persons, Patty, um, has gone into the hospital uh, for some emergency surgery. Am I correct? Um, it, it, um, she just felt bad since she went to emergency. She's holding now. Oh, okay. Um, so Martha was gracious enough to get a, a card for her from us. So it'll come around just... Uh, if you have a moment, just give her some well wishes and let her know that you are praying for her as well. Okay, so thank you, Martha, for letting me know about that. Um, before we get to tonight's uh, study, I want to go over uh, this image of the crowning with thorns. I I'm sure that this is not uh, what you would say is a typical or traditional uh, picture of the crowning with thorns. Uh, typically you see Jesus with this little circlet around his head, uh, pretty much like you see in our crucifixes. Um, and, and, and that's all well and good. Uh, but once again, I, I brought an image from the Shroud of Turin. And what's interesting about the image of the Shroud of Turin is that uh, this is obviously the face portion of the shroud and one thing that has been noted is that all up in here all up in here all up in here you see all these little dots and stuff these are uh, wounds blood uh, that are here uh, if you were to look at the dorsal image of the shroud uh, you would notice that in the back of the head there are all these puncture marks all over the head uh, that have a blood associated. This is what's called the famous number three blood stain. It comes right down the center in the form of a three. Uh, this is blood mark. Uh, what this implies is that there was something that punctured the scalp of this man all over the top of his head, all over. Because these, these little puncture marks are all over the back side of the head. So people who study the shroud have come up with that this was the crowning with thorns. But it's not like what we typically see in paintings and depictions. This image on the left is actually an, a closer idea of what it might have been based on the shroud that they basically took a thorn bush and jammed it on top of his head and then bound it with like this rope because the puncture wounds, like I said, are all over. It's not just this little ringlet around his head. And if you think about it, the Roman soldiers wouldn't have spent the time weaving this thing, you know, that would have hurt their own hand. You know what I'm saying? Just cut off a thorn bush and boom, there you are. You're the king of the Jews. Ha, ha, ha. Right? And uh, so that's why I brought this image up. Uh, so that you can get an idea that if this image of the shroud is of Jesus Christ, and I believe it is, then this again gives us a little more insight as to what this crowning with thorns was was about and it was more likely than more like the left hand image than what we typically see again in our crucifixes and our paintings of this circlet or ringlet that goes around his head so again something to meditate on uh, something else i want to bring up if anyone suffers from migraines or deep headaches um, might I suggest meditating on this particular sorrowful mystery? Because this is a mystery that focuses on head pain, head injury, and it's a way for you to unite with the sufferings of Christ in a, in a unique way. So I know in the midst of the, try to unite yourself to this particular mystery and, and, and offer it up to the Lord. 
You, 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 you understand what I'm saying? Okay. So just, just, a, just a little uh, two bits there. Okay. Chip? Yes, ma'am. No, I heard a priest say one time, he was just making a statement that the thorns were pounded in. Mm. So, I don't know. It, uh, I, I mean, the, the Gospels don't really tell us a whole lot. We just know it happened, that they crowned him with thorns as part of the mockery that they were doing with him. Um, it also says that they hit him in the head with reeds or rods. And I imagine if this was on your head and someone mm -hmm. whacked you on the head, how that would kind of like pound the thorns into your scalp. So that, that's another way of thinking and meditating on this mystery of what was happening. And by the way, it's not a coincidence that they crowned him with thorns. You go, why? What does that have to do with anything? Do you remember when God cursed the earth after Adam and Eve sinned? What he said would grow? Thistles and thorns. Thorns are a representation of the curse of sin that came upon the earth. This is Jesus taking that curse on us, for us, and offering it back up to God. Okay. So it's, it's, it, this isn't just something arbitrary. This is something very intentional. It has a deep significance. Everything that Jesus' life is about is significant. You, just have, you, you don't just gloss over it, honestly. Uh, I mean, you, just, you read the saints, and, and they will pick out the smallest detail, and you go, I've never thought of that. But, like, Mary went with haste to her cousin Elizabeth. She was excited. She just heard she was going to be the Messiah, so she went off to see her cousin. So what? The saints make a big deal that this is Mary exhibiting the uh, uh, virtue of zeal. That she just didn't sit around and say, well, I'll go visit Elizabeth next week. You know, I've got things to do here. And that, No, she went right away. So that shows a zeal, which is the virtue to the vice of sloth, or acedia, slowness. Something that small, I must have read that, I don't know how many times, and I read that and I go, really? With hate? And I look and I'm like, oh my goodness, it does say that. So it's, a, it's extraordinary the depth that you can find in the scriptures if you pay attention. You know, something like this, of thorns. Well, yeah, because they were, you know, cruel and it was a, you know, a torch, but there's more here. There's definitely more here. So, and how do you get this kind of insight? I'll tell you how. You read the scriptures daily. You ask the Holy Spirit to open your heart and your mind to what it says. You read good books and commentaries. And you set your mind to know these things, because you can know these things. They're not meant to be hidden mysteries. The Bible is not a closed book. You just have to, you have to start somewhere. And nowadays there's so much information, and good information. Yes, there's bad stuff out there. There's good information out there that if you, if you search, you will find. God will lead you. I'm fully convinced of that. He does not lead you down the path of deception. Okay? So that's just my little two cents of that. So tonight, we're going to be talking about, um, we're going to wrap up chapter 20. We finished it really last week. I want to put some finishing touches on 20 before we start 21. Oh my goodness, we're almost done. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Um, uh, it, it, it. This is my favorite book. 
and I must say this this journey has been uh, uh, incredible. I, I've been so blessed. I hope you've been blessed too, in your own way. I hope, if nothing else, those of you who've been here for a significant period of time this this past year in in going through the Book of Revelation, and even for you newcomers. Um, that you walk away from the book of Revelation with a greater appreciation of the book. Uh, no fear. And no, you should not fear this book at all. There's nothing to fear. We've gotten to the end and we win. So there's nothing to fear. Amen? Amen. And to know that these images, these symbols, are not arcane mysteries, that they can be understandable. You can understand this and know that there is so much more to learn. I mean, I've been studying this book ever since I've been a Christian. And I'm telling you, there, there's more and more and more and more. It, 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 and that's true of any book in the Bible, frankly. But this one in particular, um, I believe it was um, Origen that said, there are as many mysteries as there are words. That's how he described the book of Revelation. I think that that's very true. But mystery, not in the sense that, well, I can't, I can't make heads or tails out of it. No, 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 that's not it. Is that, that there, is, there is something of depth here that, like, if you read a good Agatha Christie novel, you want to find out more. Uh, how do we find the murder? You know what I mean? I want to know, what is this trying to say? You know, if it's the revelation of Jesus, then what are you revealing? What are you telling me? Right? He's not going to reveal something in such an obscure way that you can't understand it. That doesn't make sense. And it also doesn't make sense that this is only a book about the future, about the end of the world, so to speak. It's th that, that's not it either. It can't mean that. Because otherwise, as I keep repeating myself, it would have no significance. For, if it's only for the end of the world, then why are we bothering? I need to know how to live now. Well, it does tell you how to live now. Right? And the way you live now is in this covenant relationship with God. You live your relationship with God. That's the revelation. Because the whole thing is about marriage. Right? We've been here already. So if you're in a marriage relationship with Christ, how do you relate to your spouse? Like an obligation, once a year I have to go and receive communion. All right, let's get it over with. Hmm? Or is it, what are you going to tell me now, Lord? I'm going this Sunday. What is my mission for this week? What are you calling me to do, Lord? And so I hear the first reading. I hear the psalm. I hear the second reading. I hear the gospel. That's what the Lord is telling you for this week. And so that's why I say, close the missalette and hear, because that takes more concentration. You have to focus. You have to listen. And, and, and that's an exercise to get more engaged. You want to get more out of Mass? I'll tell you how to get more out of Mass. Try that. <coughs> and say, Lord, what is my mission? Lord, what are you trying to say to me? So regardless of whether Father is boring or engaging, hopefully he's more engaging and enlightening than boring. But even if he isn't, that's not important at that point. 
Lord, what are you saying? And then you prepare to receive him in sacramental form so that you are filled with his grace and virtue to live out that mission because we cannot do this on our own power. You cannot live the gospel on your own power. Let me just put that to bed right now. You cannot live this relationship with God on your own power. You need the grace. You need the Spirit. And how do you get it? You get it through the sacraments. You need more? Go to confession that week. You get grace for going to confession, you know. Yeah, well, I don't have any serious... That doesn't matter. You have sin on your soul. Trust me, we're all human. I heard this, and then I heard it again on Immaculate Heart Radio, so I have a good feeling I'm in good company with this. I have heard that Mother Teresa, towards the end of her life, went to confession every day. Daily confession. Do you hear that? I don't know about her, but I could go to daily confession. Sometimes I think hourly, good night. <laughs> oh, Seth isn't here, is he? Uh, Seth knows my story, you know. Uh, I, I, I've told the story about, I don't know about you, but there are times I leave the confessional and I swear before I get to the parking lot, I've got another impure thought <laughs> in my head. I'm like, really? I can't go five minutes without, without something like this. You've got to be kidding me. And you know what I've learned over the years of being a Catholic that way? Is that you're right. You can't do it. That's why you're dependent on God. That's why you keep going back. You're saying, Lord, have mercy. That's what you're saying every time you walk into that confessional. Lord, have mercy. Because I can't do this without your strength and power. The enemy would say, ah, forget about it. You're never good enough. You're never going to be good. Why are you walking? You're saying the same thing over again. You're not getting any better. Who are you fooling? That's the enemy. I'm here to expose that wicked voice right now.